im żena i błogosławem odczewa Twojego jako Distinguished members of faculty, students, guests to the university, friends and family, thanks. Perception is an overwhelming force. Collective perceptions can be contrafactual. The memories of individuals, of institutions, often magnify the inconsequential, distort, and omit. A failure of memory can be total through accident or deliberate oblivion. Shared recollections and the narratives they form shape perceptions. Yet even when these things are faulty, they can, be, they can have as much force as if they were sound, just as the effects of a rumor can be as damaging when false as when founded in fact. This evening's address is on the Great Schism of 1054, perceived by many to be the momentous event that resulted in the permanent sundering of the Western Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox branches of Christendom. Factually, however, there is a problem with this perception since it can plausibly be argued on technical grounds that no schism occurred in 1054 and certainly not the Great Schism. The perception of schism came about through cultural dissonance and alienation, East and West, which grew until at last that divorce became reality. When precisely that happened, however, is unclear. If not in 1054, when did the formal schism of the great church occur? Did it occur? From whose perspective and by what criteria? There is no scholarly consensus on these questions. Please bear in mind that I'm speaking as an historian, not as a theologian. These were the circumstances of the so-called Great Schism of 1054. Early that year, tensions east and west led Pope Leo IX to send Cardinal Humbert of Silva Candida and a papal delegation to Constantinople to negotiate with its patriarch, Michael Carolarius. In the imperial capital, relations swiftly deteriorated, and on July 16, 1054, Cardinal Humbert left a bull of excommunication on the altar of the Hagia Sophia. Subdeacons of the church ran after the papal legates with the bull, begging them to take it back. The legates cast it on the street. When it was retrieved and delivered, Patriarch Michael Carolarius retaliated in kind. Days later, he publicly burned the bull of excommunication and anathematized the cardinal and the other legates. Schism could not technically have resulted from these actions. Pope Leo IX had died earlier in the year in mid-April. The authority of the legates terminated with his death. The bull was nullified. In addition, the objects of each bull of excommunication were personal. On the one hand, the patriarch Michael Carolarius and a few collateral victims of this wrangle, and on the other, Cardinal Humbert and the other papal legates. In other words, these were not general excommunications of the entire clergy and laity on either side. Furthermore, among the charges made against the church in the East was that the Greeks had omitted the filioque formula from the Nicene Creed a charge that Rome has long since admitted was erroneous. More will be said on the filioque shortly. Michael Carolarius appealed for the support of the other Eastern patriarchs of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. Peter III of Antioch's response to the irate patriarch of Constantinople was that these were things of no importance or misunderstandings. How then? Historically, did matters arrive at the point of the perceived sundering of the church? This is a great question, which I'm inadequate fully to address, nor is there the time. What I can say tonight, however, is that this was essentially a process of gradual cultural alienation and estrangement, one in which the alienation of religious sensibilities played a prominent, but by no means the only, role. Consider that one cannot easily separate the secular and religious spheres 
in the medieval period. This clash of cultures, East and West, entailed administrative, political, linguistic, cultural, ritual, theological, ecclesial, and doctrinal differences. Of these differences, language was the most decisive. Of the many religious issues involved, the matter of the filioque, which I'll explain, and the question of papal primacy were lasting. To place 1054 in context, it will be necessary to take the more than thousand year history of the East Roman or Byzantine Empire from its inception to its end. Please bear with me while I make the case against schism in 1054. Second only in significance to the very conversion to Christianity of the first Christian emperor, Constantine the Great, was his dedication in 330 of the former Greek colony of Byzantium as the imperial capital of Rome in the East. Initially called Neorome, New Rome, and later after him, Constantinople, the city created a center of gravity for East Rome, which would counterbalance and soon eclipse the West. The divergent evolution of the Roman Empire, East and West, became permanent at the end of the century when the Emperor Theodosius the Great, in 395, divided it between his sons straight down the middle of the Mediterranean. In the following, the fifth century, West Rome would break up into Germanic successor kingdoms, but East Rome, there in the pink, Byzantium would endure. The church, however, was one. In the West, it was the only institution to survive intact. And there was a persistent notion that the oikumene, the lands inhabited by Christians and the empire, were meant to be one and the same. This belief had determined the structure of the church hierarchy and the jurisdiction of its highest bishops, the patriarchs. Two principles governed the relationship of the bishops of the great imperial cities. One was apostolic foundation. The founding of the Christian community in Rome by St. Peter meant that the Bishop of Rome was accorded precedence and a special honor. Other cities of apostolic foundation were Alexandria, Antioch, Ephesus, and Jerusalem. Antioch too was founded by St. Peter according to tradition. The second principle required the leadership of the church to conform to the political and administrative divisions of the Roman Empire. This principle underlay canons which elevated Constantinople and gave its patriarch a status second in rank to the Pope. The patriarchal sees were Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. This episcopal arrangement is known as the Pentarchy, the rule of five bishops. The Arab Muslim invasions, and you see the swathe in green, uh, reveals the uh, area of conquest of the mid seventh century by removing from East Rome its provinces of Egypt, Syria, and Palestine affected the functioning of the Pentarchy. The patriarchates of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem persisted after the invasion, but diminished and under Islamic control. Previously, there had been competition between the various patriarchs, as much between the seas of Alexandria and Antioch as between Constantinople and Rome. With the removal of three eastern seas from the empire, the rivalry between the patriarchs became simply the rivalry between Rome and Constantinople. This is the background to later strife over papal primacy. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Mutual incomprehension is fundamental to cultural dissonance. Greek was a chief language of the church in East Rome, Byzantium, as Latin was in the West. By 600, few persons were bilingual in Latin and Greek. Christians had forgotten one another's languages. Naturally, this had a determining effect on the culture of the church east and west. 
like the binary relationship that developed between the seas of Rome and Constantinople after Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem were taken into the Islamic Caliphate, so did the consequent marginalization of the Coptic and Syriac languages place Latin and Greek in stark contrast. Christians in the Greek East and Latin West read disparate authorities, different church fathers, doctors, and confessors of the church. Central to Byzantine theology were the Cappadocian fathers, uh, Saints Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nyssa, and Gregory Nancyansen. Core patristic authorities read in the West were Saints Ambrose, Augustine, and Jerome. Separate bodies of liturgy and canon law evolved and at the popular level of hagiography, saints' lives. Distinctive church cultures developed. For centuries, these divergences were accepted and shared Christian identity maintained in large part because of the spiritual principle of oikonomia, benevolent tolerance of legitimate difference. The church was one, as was its doctrine but the inflections thereof diverged over time, east and west. Christians were pondering the same mysteries, but differently due to the shaping effect of language. It is a commonplace to contrast the legalistic and authoritarian character of practical concrete Latin to the mystical and individualistic character of subtle, sinuous Greek. <laughs> While these linguistic differences can be overstated, they did generate conceptual variations. These would increasingly contribute to misunderstandings over time, as in the matter of the filioque. A digression is necessary here to explain the term filioque. The Visigoths, like most other Germanic groups that had taken over the West, had initially converted to a form of Christianity known as Arianism. In Arianism, Christ was subordinate to God the Father. At the church councils of the fourth and fifth centuries, at Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon, Arianism and certain other Christological variants which had arisen in sympathy with or in reaction against it were found to be heresies. So, in the 580s, the Visigoths in Spain turned away from Arianism and united with Rome. To render unambiguous their newfound belief in the co-equality of God the Father and God the Son within the Trinity, the Bishop of Toledo convened a council at which the word filioque and from the Son was interpolated within the Nicene Creed. And so here is the creed within context, but I want to point out the phrase in blue. What did this mean? Let us look at the crucial section of the Nicene Creed in Greek and in the altered Latin. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. And in the Latin... Et in spiritum sanctum dominum et vivificantum qui ex patre filioque procedit. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and from the Son. The addition of the word filioque and from the Son suggested a conception of the Trinity which would evolve into the doctrine of the double procession of the Holy Spirit from both God the Father and God the Son it would become doctrine of the West. Yet it must be said that distinct Trinitarian perceptions were inherent in the Latin and Greek versions of the original creed. These went back at least as far as St. Gregory Nazianzen in the East and St. Augustine in the West. The Western view is that the unity of God is absolute and the persons of the Trinity are relative within it, while the Eastern view is that the three persons have each a distinctive property but are joined in a hypostatic union. 
the languages function differently. Fine shades of meaning are lost in translation. For example, in the New Testament and the Nicene Creed in the Greek, the verb ekporeo, which, for which the Latin verb procedere, to proceed, is a rather inexact translation, conveys an idea that might have been expressed in at least three other ways in the Greek, as keistai, uh, the adirostai, probalen, simply put, Latin and Greek elicited distinct conceptual responses to the Trinity even before the interpolation of the filioque. At any rate, the filioque caught on among the Germanic peoples, including the Franks. Charlemagne himself insisted on the inclusion of the filioque in the Nicene Creed after the year 800. However, Pope Leo III, the Pope who made Charlemagne emperor, denied the filioque and the doctrine of the double procession. It was a mistake, the Pope thought, to depart from the version of the creed that had been universally accepted by Christendom and to make the point for posterity, he had the original Latin and the Greek versions uh, put on, inscribed on silver plates. Later that century, since the Franks were attached to the filioque formula, Pope Nicholas I, permitted Frankish missionaries to the Bulgars to insert the word into the creed. The Patriarch of Constantinople, Photius, objected. Antagonisms flared over this and other matters, and a brief schism resulted. Yet within a decade, Rome and Constantinople were reconciled, and Rome still refrained from using the filioque. Matters remained relatively cordial between Pope and Patriarch in the 10th century, but distantly so. Chaos prevailed in Rome in the 10th century, as in the West generally, it was an age of lead for the Latin Church. In tranquil times, Patriarchs would, would acknowledge new Popes by name on official lists, the patriarchal diptychs. This practice lapsed in the early 11th century. The last pope to be listed on the diptychs of Constantinople was Pope John XVIII in the year 1009. This break in tradition probably resulted from a failure of communications and seems to have been perpetuated in Constantinople through sheer forgetfulness and inertia. Rome, for its part, forgot at this time that the filioque formula, formula was an innovation permitted to some and for certain purposes, but resisted by Rome itself. Rome first used the filioque at the coronation of German Emperor Henry II in the year 1014. 1054 at last. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. So, what was the context of the so-called Great Schism of 1054? After a period of relative isolation in the 10th and early 11th centuries, a period in which the West was in disarray, but Byzantium had entered a phase of economic strength and military might known as the Macedonian Renaissance, a rapid shift in the power differential East and West occurred that altered the identity and perceived identity of each side. Byzantines were accustomed to having the upper hand then, in the mid-11th century, the West rose relative to the East. The incipient maturation of Western Europe and the elevation of papal ambitions resulted in greater parity between Rome and Constantinople than had been known for centuries. Parity meant renewed rivalry. A long-standing contest over which side was properly Roman, which properly Christian, intensified. Previously, the rivalry was familial. Now it was as if between strangers. The power of the papacy had surged in the first half of the 11th century. Indeed, the very word papacy dates from this time. Reflecting the sudden upward trend in Rome's self-perception, this was in, in part a reaction against the low state of Rome in the previous century. Consider the papal reforms of the 11th century, opposing simony, the sale of church offices, demanding higher monastic standards. The powerful and wealthy Benedictine Abbey of Cluny and its daughter houses peppered Western Europe. 
This was not the degraded, chaotic Latin church of the previous century. Byzantines were taken aback. <laughs> this was unexpected. Renewed relations after centuries of divergent development in secular and in church culture revealed estrangement. Christians, East and West, had long seen one another stereotypically as barbaric Latins, effete Greeks. This would worsen. In the 12th century, Franks would be barbarians and even Scythians to Byzantine princess Anna Comnena. The abbot Guibert of Nogent would refer to Byzantines as wretched little Greeks, the most feeble of men. <laughs> These secular cultural prejudices seeping into the church corroded the united identity of Christians, destroying oikonomia, benevolent tolerance. Add to this already dynamic situation a rogue element, the Normans. Much of southern Italy was Greek in language and cultural orientation. Many of its churches observed the liturgy and rites of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Political and ecclesiastical jurisdiction over southern Italy had long been a point of bitter contention east and west. Now, in the mid-11th century, the Normans defeated Byzantine forces in southern Italy and establishing a foothold there, imposed Latin practices on the Greek clergy, including the use of unleavened bread for the Eucharist. It was rumored that in retaliation, the Patriarch of Constantinople, Michael Carolarius, had closed Latin churches in the Byzantine capital, although Cardinal Humbert, the man who would excommunicate Carolarius, would later acknowledge that these stories may have been no more than hearsay. At any rate, to restore cordial relations, Byzantine Emperor Constantine IX Monomachos requested that Pope Leo IX send a legation to Constantinople. The Patriarch Michael Carolarius also wrote to the Pope offering to place his name on the diptychs. Once the legates were in Constantinople, however, there was no meeting of minds. This was a turf war. Historian Mil Milton Anastos thought that Cardinal Humbert may have negotiated from the start in bad faith, intent upon justifying the seizure of Greek churches in southern Italy for the papacy. For his part, Patriarch Michael Carolarius was suspicious and incommunicative. Little contact had occurred in Constantinople between Humbert and Carolarius when the bull of excommunication, again, technically invalid since Pope Leo IX had died, was placed on the altar of the Hagia Sophia and the legates shook the dust from off their feet. They swiftly departed the capital and there were no subsequent negotiations. The rhetoric of excommunication is dire. Quicunque fide sancta Romanae et apostolici sedis, eusque sacrificio pertinaciter contradicerit, sit anathema maranatha nec haveator Christianus Catholicus, sed proximita haereticus fiat, fiat, fiat. May whosoever speaks against the faith of the Holy Roman and Apostolic See and its sacrifice of the, of the Eucharist, the leavened Eucharist, be anathema maranatha, and may he not be held to be a Catholic Christian, but a prosomite heretic. Let it be done, let it be done, let it be done. The hot-button issue of the day was whether the Eucharist was leavened or unleavened. What else did the bull contain? There is no diplomatic way to say this. It contained polemics, errors petty and great, and ad hominem attacks. The bull was in sum a most imperfect document. It contained only one doctrinal uh, difference of lasting significance, the filioque, and misrepresented its history. Cardinal Humbert had forgotten or never knew that Rome had itself long refrained from the use of the formula and now accused Constantinople of omitting the Greek equivalent of the filioque from the Nicene Creed, getting the matter entirely backwards. 
a failure of individual and institutional memory contributed to a prominent misunderstanding. But not to schism, not at this time. Certainly the events created a stir. Riots in Constantinople followed the disclosure of details of the Bolivex communication, forcing the emperor to take a harder line than he may have wish wished against the papal legates. As for Michael Carolarius, his letter to Peter III, the Patriarch of Antioch, reveals the depth of his offense and itself contains egregious errors. Carolarius' letter, too, is an imperfect document. In his response, Peter III gently corrected and remonstrated with Carolarius, suggesting, in effect, that the Patriarch may have overreacted. When the dust had settled, the empire and the papacy normalized relations. Now, it was only later that the opinion formed that schism had started under Michael Carolarius. 1054 was fixed upon retrospectively as the date of the Great Schism after the processes of cultural dissonance and alienation were complete. This perception came into being earlier in the West than in Byzantium, in Byzantium perhaps not until the 14th century. It's easy to see how centuries later Michael Carolarius might be regarded as the agent of the Great Schism in view of his personality and later ambitions. The Patriarch was imperious and could be impetuous. When the Emperor Isaac I, whom Carolarius had helped to gain power, behaved independently, Carolarius is said to have threatened, I set you up, you oven, and I can knock you down. The Patriarch was also given to wearing footwear, if I can find it, in uh, <clears throat> the imperial red. <laughs> However, the Great Schism did not occur during his time. So, when did it occur, and how, and by what evaluative criteria? A top-down legalistic definition would be that schism occurs when a counter-hierarchy is set in place, yet such schisms can end when differences are resolved. For schism to be permanent, alienation would have to run through the entire clergy and laity on either side. This is a corporate, bottom-up definition. In the words of British historian Stephen Runciman, in fact, the state of schism only came into being when the average member of each church felt it to be there, and that feeling developed slowly over a period of years and cannot be attached to any single date. What 1054 did achieve was to move long-standing, secular cultural prejudices east and west onto the field of religion. Lists of Latin errors began to be written by Byzantines after 1054. One charged that Latins ate the flesh of wolves and baptized infants in saliva. <laughs> the west soon reciprocated with lists of Greek errors. But it was through the Crusades that rancor became general and enduring. Ultimately, two issues of difference would persist, the filioque and the question of papal primacy. There was a spectrum of Byzantine responses to papal primacy, to those Byzantines who accepted it, and many did. Primacy meant precedence in honor, now to Rome, it meant supremacy. To the Romans, church union meant the submission of the Eastern churches to Rome. But to Byzantines, it meant that the Roman bishop should resume his place as a senior of the patriarchs and be mentioned once more in the diptychs and be accorded all the deference and honorific titles due to him. Increasingly, clashing opinions on the meaning of primacy would alienate Christians east and west. Byzantine Emperor Alexius I Komnenos appealed to Pope Urban II for military aid against the Seljuk Turks, and the Pope's positive response in 1095 indicate the continuing un unity of Christendom after 1054. However, 
the crusading project thus begun by forcing Christians East and West into close proximity served to aggravate cultural prejudices and further to associate them with religion. Grievances piled up. Mutual ill will and distrust increased with each succeeding crusade. Antagonisms intensified during the time of Emperor Manuel I Komnenos, pictured here with Empress Maria Xena, significantly the Byzantine called her Mary the Foreigner of Antioch, which is an apparent irony as no other Byzantine emperor was more open to Western influence. For a time, the West was allured by Manuel's glamour. At one point, Manuel even suggested to Pope Alexander III that he take up the seat of the Constantinopolitan Patriarchate. Astonishingly, the Pope briefly considered it. But Manuel's political machinations, commercial tens tensions in the capital, and mutual grievances during the Second Crusade shattered Christian unity. Not long after Manuel's death, in the year 1182, his notorious cousin, Andronikos Komnenos, exploited popular anti-Western sentiment and resentment to advance a power grab, inciting the massacre of Franks and Italians residing in Constantinople. Fellow feeling among Christians East and West was nearly defunct during the Third Crusade. Latin Christians at the popular level considered the Greeks schismatic by the end of the 12th century. The chief issue now was papal primacy. Their contempt is unconcealed in a tune sung at this time in Angers. Constantinopolitana Kivitas Diu Profana, city of Constantinople, which has been profane for so long. On the Byzantine side, when at this time, Theodore Balsamon, an expert in the law of the church, was asked, should we continue to take communion with the Latins? The canonist replied, for many years, the Western church has been divided from communion with the other four patriarchates and has become alien to the Orthodox. So no Latin should be given communion unless he first declares that he will abstain from the doctrines and customs that separate him from us. It was in this climate of alienation and mutual disdain that the Fourth Crusade took place. The Fourth Crusade came about through a perfect storm of converging ambitions, those of the Crusaders themselves, of Pope Innocent III, of the Venetian Doge Enrico Dandolo, and of an exiled Byzantine prince named Alexios. I will not recount the series of misunderstandings that led to the Christian Crusader attack on Christian Constantinople from the 6th through the 12th of April, 1204, in the fires of which a great deal of the patrimony of ancient and medieval civilization was reduced to ashes. Atrocities perpetrated by the Latins against the Byzantine populace during the sack of Constantinople also reduced to ashes any chance of the reconciliation of Christians East and West. The responses of Pope Innocent III to news of the Fourth Crusade were tragically mistimed. Um, receiving early re reports of the Latin success, Pope Innocent III approved and rejoiced. Then, when the atrocities occurred to him, he censured and sorrowed. It was his initial approval that would be bitterly remembered in the East. So, when did the Great Schism occur? It occurred de facto in the aftermath of the Fourth Crusade during the 57-year period of the Latin occupation of Constantinople and of Byzantine exile. Historian Francis Dvornik thought that the decisive moment 
was when a Latin, Thomas Morosini, occupied the patriarchal throne in the Hagia Sophia. That would put the date at 1204. Yet this is a top-down legalistic definition, defining schism from the bottom up, the alienation of Christians east and west became general after the Fourth Crusade. In my view, the process of schism was completed during the period of Latin occupation on no fixed date. There was an attempt at this time to patch up differences, to recover oikonomia. A council was held at Nymphaeum in 1234. It ended in farce. Insistence that the Byzantines submit to papal authority meant that unionist efforts were doomed from the outset. When negotiations broke down, Latin monks stormed out of the chamber. The Greek bishops shouted after them, you are heretics, we found you heretics and excommunicates, and we leave you heretics and excommunicates, and the Latin shot back, you're heretics too. <laughs> I, I didn't mean for it to be so funny. By a seeming miracle, the Byzantines recovered Constantinople with little violence in 1261. A new and final imperial dynasty, the Paleologan, was established. However, the period of Latin occupation had crippled the Byzantine state and society. From this point, Byzantium would face implacable external enemies and mounting catastrophes, civil war, plague, impoverishment, fragmentation, brief vassalage, and finally, siege. Hoping for assistance from the West, emperors sought union with Rome, actually 40 times, but expressly, at the Second Church Council at Lyon in 1274 and at the Council of Ferrara, Florence, in 1438 through 39. The filioque and papal primacy were the chief issues. Although articles of union were signed at both councils, they were rejected by the majority of Byzantines who reviled the signatories. If one accepts the idea that schism could only persist through popular feeling, it would be reasonable to conclude that only popular feeling could undo it east and west. At the time of the Council of Ferrara Florence, Gozzoli painted this image of the Emperor John VIII Paleologos, who attended. His expression does not appear to me to be hopeful, rather resigned. Thirteen years later, the Ottoman Turks were intent on the conquest of Constantinople and what little remained of the empire. The decree of church union was read in the church of the Hagia Sophia on December 12, 1452, and the Latin mass celebrated. Many Byzantines now refused to enter the Hagia Sophia, which they regarded as having been defiled. The Ottoman attack began in earnest the following spring. For more than seven weeks, the once impregnable walls of Constantinople were pounded with heavy cannon. <coughs> then the Turkish bombardment ceased, and an ominous silence prevailed. Everyone knew that the end had come. On May 28, 1453, the eve of the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople, a final miracle occurred. Oikonomia was restored. Greeks and Latins resolved their differences. Together they processed with the holy relics and icons. All now gathered at the Hagia Sophia, and the Mass was concelebrated by Greek and Latin clergy. There, the last Byzantine emperor, Constantine XI Paleologos, approached the bishop's present and asked for forgiveness and the remission of his sins from each one. I like to imagine 
that in the eyes of those who remained to keep vigil in the great church that night, looking up to the apse mosaic, the Virgin Mary Theotokos and the Christ child gazed down upon them with infinite compassion. The Great Schism did not occur in 1054, yet the later perception of schism by providing a date for what had come into being through a long process, reifying what had not then occurred and giving it form was equally damaging. If the study of history has any use beyond the delight of the mind reflecting on the human past, it is that through mastering the past, we may overcome it. Thank you.